Hello everyone, my name is Flair Bliss here and we've returned back to the horror visual novel called The Letter where today we're going to be our first time playing a full episode with Luke Wright. The, um, the character that I would say that is probably most smug with his own decision making. Uh, I forgot to turn all this down, that's cool, excellent. Okay, so let Hannah go, call the butler, we already chose the first decision on every single choice we've made. So let Hannah go, this will probably increase our relationship, or don't do anything at all. Calling the butler would probably decrease the relationship. I don't say a word as her hand slips through mine and I am left alone for a short while. My skin is numb while she's gone and my mind wanders. My eyes roam to one of the paintings in the room. Lady and Lord Ermagrade, I suppose. Or is it their daughter and her fiancé? I had agreed to the acquisition of this house on a whim, on a thought. It is just an added bonus that I... Okay, there's a bit more of a, a space than there should be. But I share some likeness to the young lord. I'm not so vain that I thought to look in a mirror only to find it's one of the old portraits. But one can blame me if I'm preen with the chatty servants pointing out how I can very well pass off as him with a hairstylist and a costume. Certainly a great big ego boost, though only a crazy random happenstance. To imagine that it is my face on the oil canvas, having a commission befitting royalty. To believe that it is my face on those walls and believe that I've already belonged here. To believe that I have never been a street rat. The scene and the buzzing returns, as does Hannah. There is something really wrong. But what? Watching Hannah set the table gives me some time to think. I suppose it could just be a paranoia. I've been informed of a particularly noisy investigator snooping around. And Swear is as yet to catch who leaked confidential information regarding my businesses. It can be any number of things, really. I have so many things to do after this impropt day off. But as I was saying, or thinking rather, I do not want to believe this is Hannah. She is acting differently, but that's a thing humans do. Well, she's a bit more pale on the skin than usual. We are not static creatures who act our day-to-day -day in the same manner as the previous one. I care greatly about her and, knock on wood, I have hope that this odd behaviour of hers is not an omen of things to come. It is. At worst, this is merely behaviour of hers I've only failed to notice before. I do blame the party and that horrid Rosalie Lee to prove her usefulness, she said, so I do not send her away. It disturbs me greatly now that I watch her closely while she pours me a drink, but does not bother to have one for herself. It's not that I'm criticising your sudden initiative to be a housewife. This is your choice, of course. I admit I might be partly at fault. I've been neglectful, and I haven't shown my appreciation to you as of late. But you do know you don't have to really do any of this. I can see her hands shake as she offers me a cup. A cup. Did I strike a nerve? Whatever the case, I reach out to the tea before she can drop it. No, no. As it turns out, I'm the one who will end up dropping the tea, though... Mercy of mercies, the tea was cold. On the other hand, Hannah's skin burnt even more than so before. Oh, no, no, please don't be angry. I'm so sorry, my prince. A small cry escapes Wim's lips before she kneels down to clean up, picking up porcelain shards from the carpet. It is then that I notice the light sheen of sweat dotting her forehead the paleness of her skin, and just how sickly and dull she just seems to be overall. I stop her, grabbing her wrist with one and placing my hand on her forehead. She's burning up. Hannah, don't... I think you should rest. Just sit back and... The thing about people fade is that you don't really get forewarming. It's not like in the films where everything slows down and you get to watch as the other people, a person's eyes roll in the back of their head. I suppose someone can still be quick enough to catch the other as they collapse, but as it is, I can't do anything when Hannah falls to her side. The fiend of bugs on my skin is replaced by something much worse. Worse. This is all too familiar. A memory that hasn't left me, uh, even after all these years. 
She was spilled on the ground, her hair like a golden halo as it curled about her. Her pale skin made her look so ghostly, I had the irrational thought that she would simply fade away. Ember shakes. Oh, I was so worried that she would start shaking again like last time. I could do little but stare, so shocked and afraid. I was ready to call for an ambulance, though she looed the thought of going to a hospital. Mom, are you alright? Don't worry, dear, I just fell. Can you get Mommy special candy from my drawer? But this isn't my mother. There is no special candy, because this isn't supposed to happen. She's never done this before. Hannah, are you alright? Before I knew it, I am down on my knees. The cup shards dig into the legs of my pants before I ignore them in favour of Hannah. She's warm, too warm, even as I try to shake her awake. A part of me says it's, that it's a good thing. Better for her to be warm, to know that her blood still courses through her body, hot-blooded things that humans are. To know that she's still alive and that she isn't cold as death. I don't even realise it, but I'm screaming. Not until I'm pulled away. Not until I'm struggling in desperation as I refuse to leave Hannah's side. I cry to be let go, scratching, kicking, and doing everything but biting the one who dares hold me back. The images of mother dead in her body, it's bed, sorry, flash before my eyes, I need to do something, anything, I don't want to be alone, not again, Hannah, don't you leave me, oh god, wake up Hannah, you blithering hysterics help no one, right, now stay back before I knock you out, I have to keep myself from lashing out, from strangling him from dar for darling to get in the way of my wife and I, but I remind myself that Joe Hans was a doctor. He is here to help. He can help Hannah, and I will not accept excuses or suffer no incompetence. Fix her. Make sure she's alright, because if she dies, so do you. The stiff nod he gives me is probably the only gratitude I have that he'll do his best. Hmm. Keeping yourself from dying is the best incentive anyone can get, even though I cannot bring myself to rest easy. Deep breaths. Just take deep breaths. Panicking and murder isn't going to help Hannah right now. H how is she? What's wrong with her? I really can't tell. Not without further laboratory tests. It can range from anything to simple dehydration to exhaustion to vasovagal syncope. Hopefully, it's not too serious. She has a high-grade fever. It could have very well shut down her body. We'll have to go and cool her down. See if we can get it under control. Well, should we call for an ambulance? If she doesn't wake up soon, yes. It's best not to move her just yet, and... Luke, what's going on? What happened? I have no plans of apologising as I shove the butler aside to check on Hannah. But she's still on the ground. All that matters is she's awake, that she isn't dead. Just a thought of it. <coughs> I don't know what I would have done if things were to the contrary. Hey there, sunshine. How are you feeling? Do you think you're up to standing? I don't feel too good, no, but I think I can stand. She reaches out for my hand, and I'm quick to take it. Her cold and clammy skin is a cause for concern, but I force a reassuring smile on my face. At least, I hope it's reassuring. That isn't exactly an emotion I'm used to plastering in my face. I rarely have need or wants to reassure anyone else. The most I can hope for is that I do not make her worry. Come on, then, and let's get you up. Careful, careful. We don't need to fall and break something. Like a leg or your head. Though getting her up to her feet is easier said than done. She claims that she can manage to stand, but she's completely dead weight as I lift her up. Weak. Too weak. I can feel the tremor of her body, as if just existing had exhausted her. Soon enough, Joe Hans aids me, and we manage to let Hannah onto a chair without further incident. Yeah... Dear poor Hannah. Yep, start on this date. Come Saturday morning, Hannah catered to Luke, hand and foot, much to his discomfort, even serving food, despite its questionable appearance and taste. Though he managed to stop her from fussing any further, without warning, she seizes. Dear me, me. Goes on from there. Johars aids me and we manage to get Hannah to, onto a chair without further incident. I have half a mind to wrench free and run. 
This is all too familiar and I wanted no part of it. But do I even have the choice? At the moment, I suppose yes. I'm not running away. This preposterous. I'm just... I just need to get some air. Um, let's call it Jim Joe Hans. Take up, take her up to our room and take care of her, right? Schedule an immediate appointment to her physician. Get it done as soon as possible. I just need to breathe. Grey skies loom over in the horizon, though the sun fights for every precious minute it gets to stay. It'll rain again soon, with the wind bringing along the gloomy clouds normal to Luxbron. Until then, it doesn't hurt to be here for fresh air and sunshine. I walk to the gardens, what little of air there is at the moment anyway, and kneel by the daffodils. These were the first to be brought here and planted on my request, and if nothing else, they brought in a sense of peace. They were my mother's favourites. Closing my eyes, I lift my chin up and welcome the light that shines upon me. And for a minute, I can imagine myself as one of the flowers, peaceful, blooming, and all too happy to stand in its warmth. Life would be much easier if we were all like flowers, wouldn't it? Yep, we die, we grow, we die, we grow, we die. So many lifetimes within the same pot. But I didn't step out here to get all philosophical. I have problems much more practical than figuring out the meaning of life after all. Too many things have gone on these past few days, and I want to forget about them, even just for a moment. It's all... Almost all saints, isn't it? To think I've almost forgotten. I spoke the words absent-mindedly. The date means nothing to me, as I neither worship the religion or have any graves to visit. After all, mother was never given a proper burial. Oh my gosh. But it's the date. As good as any for me to grieve otherwise, I would have done so every single day. Cripping, crippling, to my, crippling, sorry, crippling myself and shutting everyone else out. I can remember how the flames lickered, so licked at her flesh and how it consumed her body until there was nothing left but ash. I stood there watching with the operator and a social service worker. Though I could have been alone for all I cared, I felt alone. It was the most that could be done. No one wanted to attend the funeral of a dead prostitute, let alone pay for it. Okay, so that was her line of work. All that is left of her, proof that she had lived, is her name written in the lodger of Luxburn's cemetery, a lighter and me. Pulling out the lighter of my jacket. Oh, Eleanor. I can't stop myself from flickering it open to stare at the flame and to run my thumb over her name. All in all, it isn't much, but it's something. And it would be wrong of me not to make something of myself when she would have given everything to make sure I could be become anything I want to be. It feels like I'm stuck in a nightmare right now. What I would give to have you here by my side, mother dear, to see you smiling at me, alive and as beautiful as ever. I'm afraid I'm starting to forget what your face looks like. I've already forgotten the shade of your hair. Eleanor Chandler was a wonderful woman, though not everyone would have agreed. Not everyone had seen past her occupation, past her vices and her illness. All they saw was a poor woman who sold her body to meet ends meet, make ends meet, sorry, and had a son because of it. We didn't see the mother who worked hard to put food on the table for me, the woman who gave and gave and gave to me while expecting nothing in return. She taught me the merits of hard work, but though I loved her so much, I worked hard for myself. I would not be so foolish, so selfish towards people who would never give back. I learnt that from father who plucked me out of an orphanage for his own selfish gain. I pocket the lighter before I could feel the urge to actually set anything ablaze. Considering my close proximity to flowers, they would most likely they would be the most likely victim of arson. Just the thought of itself as a blasphemy. Nevertheless, that doesn't save them from being picked. Just enough to make a banquet for the things in honor of Eleanor. Would you be proud of me if I saw me if you saw me now, mother? Maybe. You were always so forgiving, no matter what trouble I got into, more than I deserved, especially now. It's been a while since I talked to my mother like this. 
They say that even when our loved ones have passed on, they stay to watch over us. For I believe in neither a heaven nor a hell, a hopeful part of me wishes it were true, as ridiculous as the idea is. I can't help but grow still, a chill going up my spine, when I do feel eyes upon me. For a while, I think I'm imagining it, but I'm all too familiar with the sensation of being watched. Carefully, I scan my surroundings, doing my best to not give away the fact that I'm aware of their presence, whoever they are. But there's not a soul in sight on the field surrounding the mansion. Yet, yeah, they're on the balcony overlooking, overlooking the green. Ah. She stands there and, though I cannot see her face clearly from afar, I knew she was the one staring at me. A servant, if one were to judge by her clothing. From this distance, I can't discern what those stains on her clothes are. The woman gives off a rabid air and simply does not belong with her surroundings. That isn't what worries me, though. What worries me is she isn't one of ours. She cannot be. Obvious signs of being tattered and dirty state aside. There shouldn't be anyone else in the mansion aside from the three of us. And that's the balcony that leads to our bedroom. Forget pretending that I didn't I don't notice her. You. What are you doing there? You're not supposed to be there. It's a stupid thing to do. I realise in hindsight, but calling attention to it was a spar of the moment plan. From the height, there's no way she would have jumped off the balcony. And perhaps she would have only been able to sneak in there if her glass hand was asleep. Calling out to her would wake Hannah and at the very least call Johan's attention to the matter at hand. I dread to think of any other way she could have gotten there without Hannah calling us. The woman on the balcony doesn't react, barely even steers. Probably drug adult or touched in her head, though the bag so though the begs of the question of how she even managed to get there in there. Get in there, sorry. That changes nothing, of course, and doesn't stop me from running back to the mansion. There's an intruder in the bedroom. Upstairs now. Secure Hannah immediately. Bursting in through the front doors, I'm greeted by Joe Hans with a kitchen knife in his hand, looking weary and alert. There's a question on his lips for a moment. But he quick, he's quick to fall into place, giving me a court nod before we rush up to the foyer stairs. For that woman who... So, that woman one would need to go through us to get anywhere, and between me and the butler, there's no way she's getting away. There's no announcing ourselves as I slam the bedroom door open, expecting to see the worst inside. Ah. When we find Hannah simply seated to her vanity, without a care in the world, my relief can't be any greater. I don't even question if she's well enough to be moving around. But that is soon by followed by suspicion and caution. With our word, I signal for Joe Hans to search through the room for the intruder, even going so far as to slip into the second bedroom. She couldn't have gone anywhere, nor without getting our attention, nor without Hannah noticing. It is far too it is too far fetched to think that she may have been coerced to act like nothing is out of the ordinary. If she has been forced to do this, she won't be able to tell me without alerting the criminal. We should be ready for such things after all, being the wealthy, powerful and influential people that we are. And though I hesitate to break her peace, to make her worry any more than she has the right to be, I know that matters of safety should be shouldn't be taken so lightly. Even though I could just content myself with just watching her. Mm. Nah. A figment of your imagination. Only for the ones which have seen the curse. Wanted some alone time and fresh air. Luke excused himself, lingering in the gardens as he remembered the memory of his late mother. It was all pleasant at first until he glimpsed someone watching from the balcony. Are you alright, Hannah? There's a moment of silence as she fastens a cord around her neck, and with her back still turned to me, she replies as calmly as it can be. Of course I am. Why wouldn't I be? Is there something wrong? There is no sign of coercion or deceit. She gives none. Everything looks fine. Seems fine. Hannah says as much. Uh. Stepping out onto the balcony doesn't say anything differently. 
for outsiders devoid of signs of any other human life with how secluded the property is. For it is hard to be sure with how the sun has set, trying to locate anyone on the large balcony property by myself would be futile. Whether it is truth or convenient lie, one can only assume that everything is alright, and even Joe Hans is in agreement. There's nobody in the second bedroom or in the closet, it's all clear. Yeah, I can't fight off the awful feeling that has taken over me. Are you sure? Nobody? Double check, triple check everything, check the whole house we have to. What is going on? What is, this? what is all of this then? He claims to have seen an intruder standing on your balcony. Did you notice anyone here, madam? No, it's just been me. I've not seen anybody else aside from the two of you all day. Strange. The others have been given a day off. There shouldn't be anyone else here. Are you sure of what you saw? Perhaps you were... Yes, I am bloody well sure what I saw. There was a woman standing there, dark-haired and in servant's clothing. Are you in solo team that I am making things up? But I'm going mad, because if you are, I don't care how competent you've been, I won't have such disrespect directed at me. It's not paranoia if people are out to get me. My anger is easily rused, no thanks to the adrenaline rush that kicked in some time I don't know when. I don't think I'll ever get used to this feeling, really, no matter how many a time I've had to rely on it to sur survive on the streets as a child to survive everything with how I've managed to prop myself up. And I take any and all threats toward my person seriously. I'm not playing with your mad. The occasional hallucination is a complete normal and human experience as long as it isn't a repeat occurrence. So what? Uh, there's a trick of the light, my imagination. You haven't ingested any alcohol today, have you? A, viv a vanished question, but I am not drunk. In my state, I only realise how quiet Hannah has gotten when she doesn't joke about my debatable alcoholism. There is no cleaver quilp or words or fond exasperation. She's only been watching me through all of this, and when I did notice it, I start feeling bugs crawling on my skin. When I didn't deign to speak further, fixated on the sensation, Johans cuts in. Whatever the case, we need to establish total security. We should have done so from the start. If you were seeing things, then we got lucky. Had there been a real intruder, we were ill-prepared. Of course, of course. I trust that you can hire the most qualified from the agency. I, are you alright, Hannah? You seem disquieted. I am well, my love. I was just worried about how the hallucination brought you distress. It wasn't a hallucination. I'm sure of it. But what can I do to prove otherwise? It doesn't matter, you are safe. As am I. I overreacted. Hmm. Perhaps rest is necessary. It is late into the day and you must be tired of your gardening. Before I ask how she knew what I was doing, a small fond smile graces her lips before she brushes away a few yellow petals from my sleeves. But does it really look like I'm that exhausted? I'm sure to be well rested despite it all, and I've it's not like I've done anything physically exhausting today. Beyond running here in a hurry, anyway, no doubt I'll lead, let a trail of my uh, a trail of her flowers in my mad dash. And I suppose I do look like a mess. This sounds good. I guess I need to sleep a lot more than I thought, but I, I'll stand guard outside for the night. You two have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. I'm not so sure about that. But thinking any more about it isn't going to do anything. Come on, then, my love. Off to bed. I have been restless without you by my side. Even then, I cannot force away the uneasiness that settles over me. Sleep is hard to attain, and even Hannah's embrace does not help. She's still burning up. October the 31st. On a rainy day. Really, little sleep was had, and I felt completely drained coming morning. Even when Hannah rises from bed in spite of a mild fever and invites me down to breakfast, I can't be bothered to drag myself from the comfort of the sheets. It's not like I need to do something particularly important today. The rain that started some time during the night doesn't help the mood. Okay, maybe if it helps just a little. The strange sunny weather has been nice and all, but for it to return as it should be feels like a good sign for things to come. Perhaps we need to settle back down to normal and the crazy drama has gone on lately will die down. Rhythmic pitter patter of the rain fills the early morning silence with a steady beat. Thank goodness I don't have to be anywhere in a hurry today. I would hate to be caught unawares in this rain. 
with how it looks outside. It seems that the weather is making up all of the sunny days it has given us with a good old fashioned downpour. It does let up with a quarter of an hour, however, a day beginning with a cloud burst like this. Locals usually take it as an immediate sign. Luxburn's abysmal weather is back. Lucky. Likely for good. And I hope it did a damn good job on fixing this place because I'd rather not have to deal with leaky roofs. Though Hannah might find humour in it and perhaps ask me to see in the rain to wear out in my anger. I don't like the idea that reality did a horrible pitch with the place. We, well, Hannah, technically paid millions for this place. It better live up to the price the reality comp company sold it for. Not that it's something she, would be, she should be thrashing at the moment, when her health's not at its best. Hannah is going to be brought to the hospital for a checkup today, and if anything, I prefer that she focus on getting better. That fever, no matter how slight it is, can't be good for her. What with her odd behaviour recently. You'd think she hit her head hard against something while I wasn't looking. Perhaps a proper mess is all, all she needs, but I'd rather not assume things. I'm a businessman, not a doctor. Wonder of wonders why I even bother agreeing to babysitting duty at that. But here I am scheduled as today's babysitter for Swerys' brat. Once her father drops her off the mansion steps, though there is a worry for much, much later. If I wish to, I can ask that nobody bother me while I doze off in a cocoon of comforters. But as always, somebody has to be a buzzkill. Are you really going to stay in bed all day? What do you want? It is far too early to deal with your nosiness. You must have been really rattled by what happened yesterday. If you need to talk about it, I am quite qualified in that regard. Aren't you... and you aren't aware... Sorry, and you aren't even the slightest bit bothered. Truly, not even the slightest bit worried. I was worried, but I realise it's not my life in danger, is it? My worrying would not help matters, neither will yours. Loath as I am to admit he is right, the whole thing might have raffled me, but there's no point in jumping at every shadow I see from the corner of my eye. I shouldn't lose my head for a threat that might not even come. I should know better by now, but I've never been this worried and a possible threat in my life before. I'll be honest here, if anyone's in danger is Hannah, I can take care of myself just fine. With security tightened, I have at least one guard, if not five. Make sure nobody gets within ten feet from me without my say-so. Hannah, on the other hand, will be away for most of the day to get that fever checked. Upon my instance, it is a small relief that Joe Hans will be with her. Are there any updates about the woman? Being in the dark has me on edge. Information, any at all, may very well help me in calming down. I've already briefed security about her, and more from the agency will be arriving tonight. But there hasn't, but they haven't seen anyone fitting the description. So you have nothing then. Fat lot of use you guys are. What do I even pay you for? Do me a favour. There's the door. Don't let it hit you on your way out. Well, there is something. It's about Marianne. Can anyone blame me if I show the tiniest bit of interest? She's still not done with the house, and she's a nice enough woman. Plans to go back to sleep are gone. I called her secretary about taking the day off, but I hasn't heard from her over the weekend. She probably passed out after enjoying a pint or two or ten in a bar somewhere. She's an adult. It was the weekend. She's allowed to disappear and not think about work. Blank. I wish I was passed out after the night of drinking. She does know that mobiles are a thing. That's all well and good, but she's not answering her phone either. Mr. Parker will be finding a missing person's case with the police if she still doesn't turn up today. Have you tried checking the wine cellar? Certainly someone must know where she is. Tabs are kept, without fail, on people who come to work with me. Background checks and constant surveillance until they finish their contracts with the rice. Some would say that it's a bit over the top. Okay. So my assumption of this matter would be that... Okay, we're back up here. So I would believe in the matter that... One of these other paths will be exactly the same here, but it would be the case where Marianne was alive. So therefore, this uh, piece of text would be something else. Or maybe it would be the bottom entirely. No, that's just 
That's a scroll bar. <laughs> this is a bottom. I thought this was around on its own. I think it's really long. But I realised it was the scroll bar. Okay. A bit over the top. But I can't be too safe. Too many want me dead. What about one of her hours? Has anyone seen her? She's pretty hard to miss with how tall the woman is. The last anyone has seen of her was here, the morning of the party. Your housewoman party? That isn't good. It wouldn't do for the police to hear of this and to suspect. It's of little import, but I can easily provide my incidents. It is all a matter of principle, because even the accusation of misdemeanors should not stain my reputation. Although maybe it is a bit too late to hope for a squeaky clean one. Besides, it'll be such a hassle to have police poking around the house looking for a body that doesn't exist. Now, if we're done here, I'd like to go back to sleep and... Luke, where are you? Well, there goes any <laughs> plans of grabbing some shut-eye. <laughs> right over on my stomach, I can only scream into my pillow. Of course, of course. Ah! Luke, did you stub your toe again? They said you should always look, use your indoor voice when you have visitors. Johans, distract her. Oh, look, it's time for me to go. Have fun with your little play date. So long, farewell, and goodbye. No, Johans, <laughs> don't you turn away from me. Keep her busy for an hour. Come on. <laughs> Get what you deserve, Luke. I have to press my face against the pillow once more to suppress as a groan. You can just you, you just can't get loyal help anymore. Hello there, little frogan. Your own call is just upstairs and will be down in a moment. He is super excited to have you today, so I hope you're well rested and ready to play a lot. Fat bloke. <laughs> I'll be down there in a sec, Munchkin. Let me just mm, change into a fresh shirt, brush my teeth, fix my hair, bemoan my very existence. Wish I was anywhere else in the world right now. Don't get me wrong. Kylie is a great kid. Wonderful. Better than most brats her age. But handling a tyke is the last thing I want on my agenda right now with this whole Hannah business. Fortunately, I am well versed in how the world works. I've long learned that the show must go on. No matter what hurdles come in my way. So I set to preparing for the day. Running a comb through my hair is just divine and simply makes me feel more human. Bed hair is disgusting though. It isn't as bad as it was when I was a child. With how expensive a trip to the barbers was, I often had to grow it out until mother had the time to cut it for me. The curls and tingles were simply horrid. Why, I wasn't even mistaken as a little girl because of that. It certainly doesn't help when uh, so it doesn't help when I was named Lukuli. A freshly pressed shirt is enough to chase away the last signs of sleeplessness. The feel of crisp and clean cloth in my hands is a clear marker to the start of the day. Smoothing down my suit and my hair with a sigh, I still myself for the horrors. The horrors that come with taking care of a child. Good morning, Luke. Speak of the devil and she still she shall appear. Bright eyed and bushy tailed, Kylie grins, grins up at me as soon as I open the bedroom door. She swings her backpack she's clutching, hitting my leg in a show of impatience and looking entirely unapologetic of it. Did you just wake up? Don't tell me you forgot. It's our play dates today. I doubt I'd forget. Kylie's visits are a frequent enough thing that they found a way into my schedule. They're supposed to be visits to a godmother. But we can't pick who a child gets along with, so long as I'm not busy, her father can drop her off for the day. Which is all well and good for me, if it makes Rora's focus on work I've given him. Besides, she's a bright child, tolerable, kid's got a good head on her shoulders and can get pretty mature for her age at times. Of course, they have to thank me for that. Her parents can take pr partial credit, but Hannah and I have been there for this kid since she was just a small babe. B. While I can still remember the first time I saw her, it was during her baptism. The only reason I was there was to accompany Hannah who was to be named Godmother. She was such a tiny thing, not even a year old, and swaddled in her mother's arms and white cloth. It was the first time I saw 
I really saw an infant up close, close enough to hold one at least. Mm. Excuse me. It had been terrifying to be given a little child to carry after the whole water ceremony. I've never done so before to hold a tiny life in my arms. I could have just I could have just dropped her on her head and this little tyke before me would have stopped existing here here and there. But the child just smiled at me, babbling nonsensical words as children do, and clinging to me even as I tried to hand her off to Hannah. She had thought it hilarious and adorable. My suit had been a mess and I was nearly an anxious wreck by the time I handed her back to her mother. Yeah, it was, ple it was pleasant too. Of course I didn't, you little rug rat. I just had to take care of some things before you arrived. Really? Well, I guess it's fine. Unless you don't leave for work like last time. Really now? Why don't we go back downstairs and have breakfast in the parlour? I already ate at home. Papa made one of his tortilla de patatas. He wouldn't let me leave until I finished every bite. Ah, the Swiss's infamous tortilla de patatas. Those things are a hazard. You could probably use one to bulge not, bulge and someone into submission with how huge they are. It's a miracle Carlis can still be so energetic. I had trouble staying awake the first time I had one. Speaking of staying awake, well, I need some coffee in me, at the very least, but if you'd like, you can just jump straight to dessert. Yes, dessert, please. It's easy enough to manage a car with a promise of sweets, thankfully. <laughs> the hard part is managing her before she gets the sweets, because I nearly have a heart attack when the kid races down the stairs. Just the thought of her slipping and breaking her neck is enough to make me rush down after her. Slow down, but food isn't going anywhere. The food is going somewhere, you might <laughs> Jesus Christ, children. <laughs> With a shake of my head, I usher go towards the parlour and order a maid to bring food for us. Whatever breakfast there is along with a cup of coffee for me and an ice cream for Kylie. But I can't leave the kid alone for too long unless I want to let her turn the other room into a slaughter ground. True to my expectations, I only left Kyle alone, Kylie alone for a few minutes, but she's already made herself comfortable. The stuff from her backpack has been left scattered across the room, from colouring books and crayons to toys. She's well equipped to amuse herself with no trouble, though I can certainly breathe a little easier if she won't bring if she won't bring her doll on every time she visits. Now Casa or Sissa is a creepy little bugger. It doesn't help when Kylie left her during one. Finding the faint at the bottom of the stairs staring up at me at 3 o'clock in the morning is a memory that won't be leaving me anytime soon. Even now it stares at me from where it's seated. I wholly tempted to just throw the faint into the fireplace and bash it from whence it came. <laughs> I can buy her a prettier doll, a better toy. I will break it, find a way to get rid of it. If it wasn't for Hannah, and if only Kyle isn't so Kylie isn't so attached to it. The thing is some antique dolls she found from the brat's sixth, sixth birthday. One of a kind. My darling Hannah loves her so. And Kylie does try to be a good goddaughter. But she just kept her interest long with the wife. It's not saying that Hannah does run on her part. She just tries so very, very hard. It's just that she doesn't quite know how to really handle children. She'd never been around other children when she was young, surrounded by productive adults who catered to her every whim and worried for her safety every minute. When she isn't able to keep up with Kylie, her first instinct is to be strict, impose rules on a child treat her as if she is made of spun glass, like every movement might break her. I at least have some idea of being around street kids. I know the games they've played and how they think. I know that scraps and skin knees are all part of childhood. Even with how I grew up, I had time to be a child and not some sheltered Harris with Kylie. As behaved as she can be, with her toys and her books and arts, she has to use up all her energy somehow to run around the playground and a mess in the mud or even just fake wrestle for a short while. Let her be a child when she wants, I say. If it becomes too much, just bribe her with sweets or ship her back to her papa. 
problem solved. Unfortunately, Hannah isn't quite up with these sort of things most of the time, thinking it'll spoil the child. It turns a whole play day awkward. Every time. Taking the last seat left, I pluck one of her coloring books from the table and see it filled with dinosaurs. Not exactly what I expect to see from a little girl, but eh, it doesn't hurt anyone. If she wants to play with dolls and cars, or dolls with their cars, what do I care? She once put dolls' tutters on model cars, even. This is a new one. The last time he had was filled with horses, wasn't it? Those were ponies. They're much cuter than horses. But we want a dinosaur zoo, and it was awesome. Fairy Tino? Fairy dinosaurs are my favourite. I have no idea what that is, but must be something. I'm only familiar with the T-Rex myself. Yeah, they found a fossils of its claws. They're really long. They think the whole terry might be a bazillion meters tall, even bigger than the T-Rex. Sister says it's, it'll be enough to eat all my classmates. My god, look at her eyes. She only laughs as I scrunch up my nose and grimace. Takiko says you're making a really funny face. Taka who? Takaka, a friend I made. I have to stop and look around, expecting one of the help to be there. The child does have a way of befriending just about anyone. <clears throat> anyone, sorry. As long as she puts her mind to it, yet the two of us are completely alone. Thankfully, she only finds my disturbed look as another funny grown-up expression. <laughs> that might be a lot more problematic than whether she plays with dolls or cars, though. Both the force of sister giving Kylie ideas, and one of them I... Sorry. And one of said ideas being massacred by a dinosaur. Something I probably need to bring up with her father aside from work. But beyond murderous dinosaurs, creepy dolls and imaginary friends, I find no trouble with Kylie. She's as energetic and pre preconscious as any tyke her age can be. She's an angel if she can get comfy and settle in after getting her sweets. Ah. Oh. God, look at those waffles. Look at the ice cream and those fruits. We tuck into our waffles as soon as food is brought in. Our waffle was because she wanted her own plate to go with the ice cream as soon as she saw mine. A fresh plate of berries is brought in as well, which really goes great with the rest of this feast, as Carla puts it. And if I indulge in the sweetness, I have a cup of black coffee to put it off with. Pair it off with, sorry. With our bellies full, Kylie grows content with just scribbling on a scrap of paper and calmly chatting about her week. She talks about her older brother Rowan and their parents. Are they planning to go to the Bloxland in Berkshire? No, Berkshire for the week's winter holidays, sorry. She talks of Miss Pink, and I have to shift my legs to become comfortable once more. The memory of my initial meeting with her is still fresh on my mind. She talks of a sad man in the park and her and of her new friend who likes to play hide and seek when she's not s snoofing in the loo. When, finally, she finds nothing new to talk about, she goes back to her drawings. They don't change as soon as her stomach settles, of course, the calm before the storm. Because behaved as she is right now, I can, own, I can feel the curiosity just radiating off her. There's a restlessness buzzing under her skin and a question on the tip of her tongue as they often are with children her age. But, uh, but for now, I can take this piece with no complaint of however long it stays. I have fun with the crowns as well, at the child's instance, even if I can't really draw. With Kylie using the black crayon, that leaves me with a blue one. I absentmindedly start to draw a puppy to the best of my abilities. It is as I attempt to give doodle dogs another eye that Kylie breaks her silence. Um, Uncle, where did Auntie go? I saw them leave when I got here. Auntie didn't look so good. I have been expecting a lot of different questions. The kid always has a whole bunch of them ready for me, but I can only sigh when she posed this particular one. She's just going to the doctor's for a checkup. And as kids go, there are follow-up questions too. And you didn't go with her? Well, 
You were going to be here, sweetie, so I had to stay behind. So she's all alone at the hospital? Oh no, of course not. Auntie has Johans with her and a maid as a and a guard. She's got plenty of company. Yeah, but you're not with her. If I didn't know better, I'd say the kid is trying to make me feel guilty. I would just say that the little tyke is evil for making me feel so. But I understand. When I got sick, Papa and Mama had to leave me with the maids too. They don't take care of you? That doesn't sound right. Even my mom took care of me when I was sick as a child. Well, they're always busy with work. Oh, oh I see. I guess that's no good. I know she doesn't mean to excuse, accuse me or anything, but as her father's boss, maybe I do overwork Swerves a bit. There's a lot of responsibilities that only he is capable of carrying out. Means trust as well. Delegation is a thing, sure, but when said responsibilities are legally questionable at best, putting others to the task isn't always an option. But, maybe a papa is in need of some vacation time. He deserves it, doesn't he? He's a hard worker. I can arrange something for the holidays. I could cut him some slack. Some of his assignments can wait. Look at her eyes, okay. I can't do much for her mom. She isn't one of my employees, but this would have to suffice. Ah, it would be worth it if if it makes the little girl happy, because just like that, the somber look on her face just turns into one of pure joy. It's looking like a little sun. So it's like looking at a little sun, warm and bright. It's nice to do something kind every now and then. Would you really, Uncle? Would you like that? I'd like that very much, yeah. We can go to this museum. There's one with a lot of cool trains and planes. I like trains. And there's the local manor theme park and a monkey forest. There's the kids' adventure farm too. The wacky warehouse and a play barn as well. And, and... Well, slow down there, Munchkin. I know you're excited, but I think you should let me schedule your dad's day off before you plan a whole year's worth of stuff. <laughs> There's an embarrassed giggle, but she does reel herself in, enough to calm down, which is a fleet in and of itself. It's obvious how giddy she is, and if she wasn't looking forward to the holidays like any child should, she does now. I think Auntie would be really happy if you were with her. You could have told me he needs to go to the hospital with her. Uncle, I won't be angry. I'd love to be with her, but I wanted to spend time with you, and she told me to stay. Besides, I don't like hospitals. They always smell like alcohol, not the good kind either. I don't think anybody likes hospitals. They're scary. But you said Auntie is brave and strong. That she is. A content silence comes over us as we go back to scribbling. Though I stop when I'm done with my blue dog, cringing at how awful it is. Kylie repents me for that because I should be like her. The little tyke goes through several sheets of paper, one drawing after another. Practicing, she says, because practice makes perfect. Practice is a C rather than an S. Not to mention there's a drawing contest coming up in class and she just has to beat Tim from Class D, who says girls can't be superheroes. The clay gets a turn too, where we start sculpting food and pretending we're Macklin chefs. When we're too tired from tossing pizza and making cakes, there's no trouble in finding another activity more relaxing for the both of us. I find myself invested in reading the picture of Doreen Gray once more. Often I lose myself in the pages of a book. However, it is rather difficult to do so when I'm also trying to keep an eye, out, eye and an ear out for Kylie. I've been reading the same paragraph over and over again even. Inexplicitly, I feel my skin crawl when the girl sits with Narcia by the parlor's fireplace humming, singing, but I ignore it long enough to hear only the tail end of the song. Everything is up in flames, up in flames, up in flames. Everything is up in flames, my fair lady. I don't think I could spend any more time with Kylie, considering how high strung I feel. So it is a good thing that Swerves came for her as soon as I've called. Though it is earlier than the agreed upon time, her voice, he voices no complaint. But Blank even has a look of relief as soon as they left. Or at least I interrupted it as 
from where I stood by one of the windows, not bothering to step out and greet the man. No doubt he still doesn't trust me around his spawn. Well, he has every right to be suspicious of me. I am a dangerous man after all. Yeah, you don't think. You don't think that for one moment. With Hannah away for a checkup, Leek was left alone to watch over his godchild. Kylie Suarez. However, what was supposed to be a simple babysitting turned awkward when the pre precautious child began spouting bizarre things. Yes, but to my chagrin, that leaves me with the rest of the day with nothing to do. Well, aside from picking up that the mess Kyle left scattered about in the parlour, to my immense, immense relief, she remembered to take a doll with her this time. But the same cannot be said for the crowns of papers lit littered here and there. First thing says, I snatch my own doodle off the table and rip it to shreds, leaving no hope that it will see the light of day. The rest of the drawings all kind of remain unharmed as I collect the lot. Though they have been stacked near neatly on the table before, they must have been blown about when I saw Kylie off. And there are plenty of them. From cats in cakes to colourful rainbows and gardens, the child managed to make a lot during her morning here. There is one more thing that I have to fish out of a fireplace where, I, where it landed. I expect to see another one of Kylie's masterpieces. I am instead greeted with something a bit more concerning. Ah, oh, There is me. Then there is Kyle. The two of us side by side and smiling as our stick figure sleeves stand in a nondescript field. There's much I can ascertain without looking at the labels before the doodles first. But a third figure stands next to me in the drawing. A woman with a face hidden behind a curtain of black. Takiko, the writing under her supplies. Takiko said you're making a really funny face. Takahu? Takiko, a friend I made. The hairs on the back of my neck stand on end and I feel a chill going down my spine. <coughs> Excuse me. A brief that isn't mine. Hmm. That has me turn around, expecting, hoping to see someone, anyone, but nothing. And that's when I hear it. Laughter. Sweet and merry laughter ringing from the ballroom. Think about it has my cheeks burning, my blood running hot. It's as if I'm being mocked. As I stomp towards the door, I have to stop myself from shouting up a storm. I expect to see some of the help, dallying about idle from their duties. Perhaps they thought they can slack off from their duties without the head butler around and with my preoccupation with Kylie. Well, they had another thing coming. But again, nothing. Nothing from what I can see with a curious gl courtesy glance, at the very least. I room around, looking for near impossible hiding places, and still, I am not alone. Yet yeah, I can still hear the laughter, that cursed laughter, echoing about in the room, in my head. Who's there? Show yourselves and show some respect to the master of the house. Cool uneasiness settles into my stomach when no one answers. I stumble on my own two feet, feeling a wave of nausea coming from nowhere. I have to put a hand against the wall to stay upright when the world shifts and pain explodes from beyond my eyes. It takes every ounce of my self-control not to heave, then and there. The only thing my pride allowed me to do is to close my eyes and attempt to elevate for some of the pain. Vague, unfamiliar images, dare I say memories not mine, flash in my head, unbidden and unwelcome, like a strong hammer strike to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. Whatever motions they hold are muted, I'm nothing but a spectator, still, its weight feels palpable, though it doesn't take long for these sensations to get into my head. Through my eyes and my ears, it creeps and buzzes in the spaces between them. Hmm. My heart feels like it's seizing in my chest, like it's being squeezed and the pressure won't stop until it bursts. 
Are you truly strong enough over some hearsay? Be sensible. What you did, it is, it is, there are no words. You bring disgrace to this family. This rotten noble standing in front of me is not the cousin I grew up with. This is not the lady I fell in love with. She would never do such unspeakable things, Charlotte. I bring disgrace? I bring disgrace? I'm not the idiot who's running off in the middle of the night. You promised, Edward. You gave me your word. Don't you dare turn your back on me. I swear to you. If you stood one foot out of these lands, mark my words, Edward, I will. What? What is it you swear? Will your man steal me away? Defy me, too, like what you did to yourself. There is an undercurrent of fear I'm in danger. My head screams at me, and there is hurt. A deep burning shame I can feel on the woman's belief behalf. Looking at her on its own is a chore I cannot bear. One after the other, they come at me, an unending flood that threatens to sweep me away from what feels like an eternity. Each one, a show of both joy and suffering for those who have called this mansion their home. Each new scene is like a hammer to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. I can feel every little emotion in the blurry images that present itself in my head. I feel part of those, like I lived through them, for I know that is not possible. All that anger burns through me. There is much, there is much in evident, but the pain, the pain is more so. And above all that are the whispers, the voices calling, luring, until one image emerges in vivid contrast with the others. When there is a shout of joy, my eyes snap open, looking for the culprit. That's when the whole room just changes. Everything the same, yet everything isn't. Hallucinations of the past and living memory. There are people everywhere, laughing and dancing. I should be concerned about them, but my mind finds it easy to dismiss them as they fade in and out from nothingness. Instead, I find my concentration drawn to a man and a woman, though one can only call them a lord and a lady, going by their clothes. Oh, and oh, just seeing how happy the couple looks, though the man's eyes are eerily blank. Like he's not at all there. His face is familiar though. In fact, they both are. I can't quite piece place why. The two make for a pretty picture as they dance in the center of a pool room. Even the phantom crowd's attention stay on them. It reminds me so much of Hannah and I during the early days of our marriage. The honeymoon years, we call it. We were happy then too. All smiles and her sunshine. Even with the normal dreary weather younger, we had less to worry about, or at least thought that way. I thought wished we could go on that way, even with all that I did and had to do. But life has a way of cashing up. There was work to be done. Although we had to stay the loving, perfect couple in public, I could not I could not afford to look so weak. To appear tied down to someone else to those who know I who know who knew who I, I really am. Sorry, trouble pronouncing that part there. I had to harden my heart when I have business, but it hadn't always been so easy to just switch that part of me on and off. I should be concerned about their intuition too. Ask what in bloody hell they are doing in my house, throwing a party as if they own the place. Ask myself how the blank I didn't give, I didn't notice what was going on when the parlour and the foyer are both the, only a few doors away. But I have a feeling that yelling and screaming at them won't do much of anything anyway. None of the others have given me notice. I realise that this might not even be real. It dawns on me that these two are the people from the paintings, the ones all over the mansion. Which makes sense. I don't think I'm imaginative enough to make all of this up on my own. This must be a dream, or a really horrible high. Just then I can feel eyes on me as I contemplate the absurdity of the situation, yet I find difficulty in trying to tear my eyes away from the two dancing I manage, and I regret looking away. Yes. The woman from the balcony stands beside me. I can hear a rattling breath menacing and chilling, everything in me screams to run, but something pins me to the spot as she just looks at me, watching and waiting. The clammy of their voices fill the ballroom, although they say such welcoming words, I do not feel comfort 
it by the madness I'm experiencing. Their joyous voices turn sinister and forbidding to my ear. The cause of people, people that shouldn't exist, threatens to overwhelm me, drown me, even as I stand on dry land. These music still plays as the quiet courtyard comes where I stand here, vulnerable and afraid, but the dance has already ended, and I'm afraid that I might just be tonight's entertainment. Attention is all well and good until bollocks like this goes down. These pan phantom people watch me, thousands of eyes scrutinizing, though they cheer for my return. Cajun me to dance and join the merriment. There are eager hold so there are eager hands all over, pulling me in every direction, but they do not move me enough to remove me from the woman's gaze. Listen, can you not hear them as they welcome you home? Your kind, our kind, you're one of us, my love. We are bounded by the blood we share. If I thought the voices were overwhelming before, it is nothing compared to how they are now. Their voices are loud, speaking and using an echoing ever on in, in spaces of my head. They welcome me back as if I've already belonged, as if I was meant to be here in the first place. They call me all these titles and names that do not belong to me in that man's face. The one with the empty eyes flashes again before me, once fleeting, like a new memory has burned itself in my mind. I have to struggle for air when I come back to myself after. I'm not. This isn't. The welcomes turn into screams at my protest, pained and desperate pleas for my help. Telling me that it's my duty to stay. Telling me that I belong amongst them, to them. Gentle touches turn near threatening. For warm scratches and the bearing teeth by predators before they truly maim someone. My mouth goes dry as I struggle to speak some sense in this hallucinatory madness. But I don't get the chance as they drown me out, drown, drown out my voice. Our Lord, my Prince, at her words. There is a compulsion to stay, but my heart races in my chest. The fear I should be experiencing refuses to register in my head. Mind and body war with each other, nearly tearing me in two. Are you finally returned to us? The compulsion to walk into her arms is strong. Whispers in my head tell me to go to her. They say that she is safety. She is home and heart. We have been waiting for so long. But we pulsed at the face. So, we pulsed at these thoughts. I wrench away and turn in with a small gasp. Without hesitation, I start to make a run for it. I leave hold when an angry shriek pierces the air. Inhumane and monstrous. I don't dare look back, I just run. I don't care if this is a drug induced hallucination or not. Just run. Out of the ballroom. And out of the parlour. It's only when I bother to look up, hoping and praying to the god that I scorned but it did not pursue me. I would have run away out of a mansion too, if only someone didn't get in my way. I climbed with a body much larger than mine and fell to the, right to the ground, head spinning as I look up at the stained glass. Turning my head to the side replaces a colourful sight with a pair of shiny black shoes. Fatigue fills every inch of my being turned, making me refuse to get up. Meanwhile, a familiar head of ginger head hair looks down at me in amusement. You really must look where you're going if you insist on running about. Don't tell me where's... Do tell me where... You really must look where you're going if you insist on running about. Do tell me where's the fire. Okay, so that's going to be all for today, folks. And I hope you enjoyed that as much as I have. And we're going to be on our next time of the letter where we shall be probably be catching up to where we left off to on the Ashton's chapter. Have a good day and take care of yourselves.